hey, today, here's what we're going to do. Uh, we're going to dive into a powerful teaching from the Lord Jesus Christ that's found in the gospel according to Matthew. So if you have your Bible, go ahead and take those out, turn those on. Matthew chapter 5. Now remember, we say this often, there's only one gospel. The gospel is good news of Jesus, but we have four different accounts of that. Uh, we have Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. The first three are what we call the synoptic gospels, basically meaning they're the same. They're just writing the three different target groups or three different audiences. And, and then you have John. And John is a different gospel. It's far more intimate uh, than the first three. Today, we are going to be in the gospel of Matthew. Now, remember that Matthew is writing to a Jewish audience. So there's things that he may share uh, that the Jewish audience, uh, 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 target audience that he's writing to, uh, either they already know this, uh, something they're very familiar with, and so they're going to get, you're going to see a different reaction from them. So Jesus is going to introduce to them, I would say to us, a very, very challenging principle that he's going to teach. And I'm sure most of you have probably heard the, the phrase that, that someone will say, hey, go the extra mile. Uh, maybe a parent has said it. Maybe an employee has said it. Uh, maybe a teacher or a coach. And they've said, hey, I need you to go the extra mile for me on this one. Uh, I came across this quote from the late Zig Ziglar. And Zig said this. There are no traffic jams on the extra mile. But I'm not sure if you know that this timeless wisdom traces all the way back to the words of Jesus. So if you are physically able in our West Auditorium and of course in here, would you stand with me for the reading of God's word? Matthew chapter 5, starting with verse number 38 through verse 42. Here's what Jesus says. Remember, this is the Sermon on the Mount, the most famous sermon ever preached. You have heard that it was said, eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth. Basically, here was the thought. Uh, you knock out my eye, I get to knock out your eye. You, you knock out one of my teeth, and I get to knock out one of your teeth. Jesus says this, but I tell you, do not resist an evil person. If anyone slaps you on the right cheek, turn to them the other cheek also. And if anyone wants to sue you and take your shirt, hand over your coat as well. And if anyone forces you to go one mile, go with them two miles. Give to the one who asks you. And do not turn away from the one who wants to borrow from you. Let's pray together. Father, we ask now that your Holy Spirit would take your Holy Scriptures and Lord would illuminate those to us. Lord, we want to hear from you today. So God, would you speak? Uh, Lord, I pray uh, that you would encourage us, challenge us, convict us, rebuke us, but God, in inspire us uh, to move closer to the life that you've called us to live for it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. Someone once said this about the Bible. I have no problem with those parts of the Bible that I do not understand. It's those parts of the Bible I do understand that gives me fits. Well, the passage that I just read from the words of the Lord Jesus certainly fits into that category. In the first century, you need to understand that a slap on the face, a slap on the cheek, first of all, that was extremely insulting. But then a second slap on the cheek or the other cheek, it was a way to humiliate someone. So today, maybe you've heard someone say, oh, that was a backhanded compliment, right? Basically, what they were saying was, man, that was an insult, if not very humiliating. Uh, there were two things that a Jewish person over 2,000 years ago would have absolutely hated. One would be to be spit upon. The second 
would be to have someone slap your face. As we were looking at this text that Jesus shared, we were reminded of another verse in Matthew. Matthew chapter 26, verse 67. And it says this. Then they spat in his face. They beat him. And others struck him with their palms, with the palms of their hands. You see, exactly what Jesus would be asking his followers to do is the exact same thing that he himself would endure. But it's verse 41 of Matthew 5 that really stands out, and it's where we want to focus our attention this morning. If someone, and look at the word there, forces you to go one mile, then you go with them Two. Now, notice that Jesus doesn't say, hey, if someone asks you kindly or if, or if someone asks you politely. No, Jesus uses strong language here. Jesus says, if someone forces you to go one mile, then he instructs his followers, you should go two miles. So in this moment, as Jesus is teaching, uh, he is sharing with his disciples, I would say with us even today, that there is a different, higher standard of living that Jesus is calling us to. One that not only transforms us, but it also transforms those around us. Now, this teaching of One mile, two mile, obviously it's a foreign concept to us. I mean, I I doubt seriously that any of you in the room have ever been forced to go one mile. Now, maybe a PE instructor or a middle school, high school, college coach has asked you to run a mile. Maybe you're in trouble and you had to run a mile. But no one's ever probably forced you, demanded you to go one mile. So what is these random miles that Jesus is talking about? Well, uh, he's using imagery here, right? That the person in his audience on that day, they would have known this. And not only would they have known it, they would have despised this teaching. And so there's a couple of things we want to do today. One, you have to understand the meaning of of the second mile. So if you're following along on the Bible app, or if you're just taking notes today, number one, second mile meaning. So over 2,000 years ago, Israel found themselves under Roman law after a painful takeover of the Holy Land. The land that God gave to his chosen people back in that day. And when the Romans conquered a territory or a province or a city, what they would do is they would go to the main meeting area of that community, and then they would erect this arch uh, as a walkway, and they forced every single citizen to walk under that arch, and under that arch, they had posted what the new rules, what the new regulations would be, and hence, what you are now agreeing to. The things that you're saying, yes, I will obey these commands, I will live out what you have posted. Where would that be for Tampa? Maybe they would have us all gather at Raymond James or maybe Emily, maybe the conve- I mean we have pirates that invade every year. So maybe the convention center, something similar to that, but it was not playful. This was extremely painful and the Jewish people despised it as the Romans were kind of rubbing it in your face that we are in charge now. And this is going to be a different day. And so one of the laws, one of the rules, one of the regulations that they would post is this thought of carrying a soldier's bag or carrying their weapons, their knapsack, their burden for one mile. Now, it did not matter if you were working in the garden or if you were on your way to the synagogue to worship. If a soldier asked you to carry their bag, you had to drop everything and walk with them for one mile. But here Jesus tells his followers, don't go with them one mile. 
go with them two miles. And, and they would ask, maybe what you're asking, like, what does this mean? Like, what is this teaching about these random miles? Well, one, he's teaching them to give more than what they're asked. He's also teaching them to love beyond their duty and then to serve even their enemies. So he's inviting them to mirror the life that Jesus himself was living. I, I want you to look at just a couple of verses above or past verse 41. Look at verse 45. Matthew 5, 45, and says this. Because God causes his son to rise on the evil and the good. And he sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. So picture this. You are a Jewish person at home, and, and, and you're maybe working in the field, or, or possibly you're, you're just sitting outside of your home, and a Jewish or a Roman soldier walks up and says, commands you to drop everything you're doing and to carry their equipment for a mile. Imagine the frustration. Uh, imagine the feeling of oppression that they must be going through. And knowing this, and how much the Jewish people hated this, they would have these mile markers where, where they would walk off a mile and they would have certain little markers, certain little pegs, so that they knew this was how far they had to go. And the thought was not another foot not another step beyond what was required. And Jesus is basically saying, you can take down your mile marker because I'm going to ask you to walk right past that. And, and so on that mountainside, as Jesus is preaching this revolutionary new way, these values of the kingdom of heaven, he drops this, we would really say like this bomb of a teaching on them if someone forces you to go one mile, go with them too. I mean, can you imagine the reaction of the audience that day? I mean, they're probably stunned, maybe even outraged. Some are probably whispering. Are, are you telling us that the Messiah that we thought was going to come and overtake Rome, the one that we thought would give us back our land, he's partnering, he's siding with the Romans, but Jesus was saying, really, Jesus was teaching something far more radical than following the Romans. He was teaching about a new kind of kingdom, and with that new kingdom, there would be this new way for, their, for his disciples and for us to behave. So that's a little bit about the meaning of the second mile. But what does second mile living look like? So Jesus calls us to a standard that goes beyond human expectation. Really, it's called second mile living. And as Christians, we are not commanded just to be kind or to compliment others. We're called to go beyond that peg. We're called to go beyond that marker. We're called to show the love of Christ in ways that are going to cause people to pause. Pause and go like, why would, why would you do that? Like, wh why would you say that? How, how can you treat me so kindly? That, that we are to live in such a way that honestly, it surprises people. Like, there's surprise in the world we live in? You, you're going to do that for me? Like, it is a surprise and a shock that it makes them, at least in their heart, see a glimpse of God. The second mile isn't about meeting the world's minimum standards. It's about exceeding those standards. And Jesus teaches us, he teaches his followers, that we are to be sweeter, kinder, more forgiving, more compassionate, even when it doesn't make sense. Even after an election. Like that is who we're supposed to be. 
Like we're supposed to be this, sweeter, kinder, more forgiving, more loving, more compassion, almost to the point it's like it doesn't even make sense the way you live your life. That's the life that Jesus was calling them to, and especially even to those who didn't deserve it. So the Bible is filled with second mile living people who based on their love for God went above and beyond what the call of duty was. The the first one I thought about was Joseph. Many of you remember the Old Testament story of Joseph and how his father gave him this special coat. Matter of fact, some of you have actually gone to the Broadway play. Maybe that's the only way you know about Joseph. And that's okay. But Joseph was this brother that really was favored by his father. And the uh, rest of the siblings did not appreciate it at all. Matter of fact, they wanted to kill him. But one of the brothers said, well, what good is that going to do us? How about if we sell him? instead and so they do so and Joseph ends up in in Egypt and there in Egypt Joseph becomes a prisoner and then Joseph goes to the palace and then Joseph goes back to prison and then Joseph goes back to the palace and ultimately there is this famine where his brothers after years of separation have to come back to him and now Joseph is the second highest ranking official And so they come before their brother Joseph, and here's what he says. You meant evil against me, but God meant it for good. Joseph was a second miler. Joseph was this person who extended forgiveness and provided for his brothers who wronged him deeply. Another second miler that we thought about was David. David, who was beloved by Saul, and and, and, and Saul took David in almost even as a son. But then David's popularity and fame started to outgrow that of Saul, and Saul became very jealous of David to the point that he tried to have David killed on many occasions, hunting him down. And yet, when David found Saul helpless, He spared his life. And here's what he said in 1 Samuel 24. I will not stretch out my hand against my Lord, lowercase l, meaning Saul, the king, for he is the Lord's anointed. And so David didn't just spare Saul's life. He honored him. He respected him. And and he went the second mile in forgiving his persecutor. How about the great story in the New Testament, the parable that Jesus tells of the Good Samaritan. What a great example. When there was a man left wounded on the side of the road and, and, and different people passed by him and some said, oh, I'm sorry that you were hurt. Others said, I'll pray for you. And they continued on their way. And yet there was this Samaritan. And he bandaged up the man's wound, and he placed him on his animal, brought him to the inn, and said, whatever expense, you can put it on my tab. Like, I'll pay for everything. And Jesus used that person's life to show us that's what it means to live a life of the second mile. And and the Good Samaritan, of course, is where we find the meaning of Love your neighbor as yourself. Now, I understand that Thanksgiving is right around the corner, but it's not here yet. And and then right after that is Christmas. And many of you do not mention Christmas, nor do Christmas decorations go up before Thanksgiving. And that's fine for you to be wrong there. But for others, right, where it's like, that's one of the reasons I love going to the Dominican Republic. Uh, They do not celebrate Halloween. They don't celebrate Uh, Part of that is uh, the witchcraft and voodoo that's associated with Haiti that they don't want coming over to their island, so they just say, no Halloween. Obviously, they don't celebrate, recognize this day of Veterans Day for them, and so uh, they don't have Thanksgiving. So uh, you go to the Dominican in October, and Christmas stuff is up everywhere. I'm like, I could be a part of that, but think about it. 
Christmas is all about going the second mile. When Jesus left heaven to come to this world, he went the second mile. When, when the king of kings was born in a lowly stable, surrounded by smelly animals, he went the second mile. And when Jesus died on the cross for the sins of the world, my sins of the sins of the world, he went the second mile. And every day that he lets us live, he goes the second mile. And yet every day that he allows you to live as a non-believer, he's going the second mile so that you would realize that this is the day of salvation and yet another opportunity for you to be saved. And in so doing that, he goes the second mile. But what about us? Like, How can you and I live out this second mile lifestyle? Well, what about this? When, when your boss asks you, hey, I, I need you to make 15 phone calls by the end of the day, and instead of 15, you make 25. That's going the second mile. Uh, what about when your neighbor comes over and now that you know each other because of the hurricanes and they ask you, hey, uh, could I borrow a cup of sugar? And you're like, no, I'm going to give you the whole bag and some chocolate chip cookies I made last night to go with. Like that's going the second mile. Or when you maybe go out to eat and possibly the food and the service isn't what you thought it should be. And instead of tipping 20 to 25%, what if you tip 40 to 50%? That's going the second mile. What if you are a student, a, a child in the room, and your parents say, uh, hey, I'm really going to need you to, to make your bed. And, and, and the, the, the son or daughter responds, no, no, I'm not just going to make my bed. I'm going to make every bed in the house. Matter of fact, I'm going to start a YouTube channel to teach other kids how to make their bed. Like, that's going the second. The Divinity said, amen. Thank you, Lord. Um, <laughs> what about if you see a friend struggling and you just offer maybe to take them to grab coffee or to lunch and you listen and you pray with them and then you text them later to show your support. See, this is a radical, sacrificial love. But here's the thing. It doesn't make earthly sense. Can we agree? Like, it doesn't make earthly sense, but it makes perfect heavenly sense. So Jesus calls us to show, to live out what loving above and beyond really looks like. You know, on this day that we've set aside to recognize our uh, veterans and their families, I came across a story that I felt like really fit the moment. This country that we live in really is the result of a man going the second mile. See, shortly after the battles that ended the American Revolution, but before peace was negotiated, uh, George Washington was with his troops there in New York, and amongst the troops there began to grow some restlessness because they had not been paid the salary that they had been promised. They had been serving and fighting, but with no pay. And Washington had to beg the Continental Congress to do what they said they would do and to pay these soldiers, but they refused to do so even after he met with them. And therefore, the officers said, if they will not listen to George Washington, who would they listen to? And so they decided to form, to organize this rebellion. And they talked about marching all the way to Philadelphia, which was at that time, of course, the seat of the reigning national government and overthrowing the government. And now this army would rule this new nation. With the fate of America in the balance, George Washington made a surprise appearance before the officers. And after passing out his thankfulness and gratefulness for them serving and after praising them for their sacrifice, 
In his pocket was a letter that he had written. Historians tell us that he fumbled with it, getting it out of his pocket and was moving it back and forth as if to try to get it into focus. And then George Washington reached for a set of reading glasses. Glasses. These men had never, ever seen him wear glasses. And Washington made this simple statement. I have, already gro- I have already grown gray in the service of my country, and now I am going blind. Historian Richard Norton Smith wrote this, Instantly, the rebellion melted into tears. It was a galvanizing moment, and the rebellion was put down because they had never seen before a second Myler. Wow. See, becoming a Christian is one thing. Being and behaving like a Christian is another thing. We've talked about this passage from Matthew 5, but of talking about it doesn't do justice. I thought the chosen did a phenomenal job of showing you. So if you would direct your attention to the screen. Jewish citizens! Everyone remain calm. Disarm yourselves and leave your bags. You're carrying ours now. Under Roman law, a soldier can force a Jew to carry his things. At random. There is a legal limit, a maximum of one mile and no further. Master, this is humiliating. We will comply with dignity. (laughs) What must it be like? Walking around all day with no metal weighing your head down. Ever have helmet hair? (laughs) You too. You. I think I... I'm not made of straw, Matthew. I can carry it. Hurry along, rats! Rats with nice hats. <laughs> we know this has been an honor for all of you. Stop here. I said stop. The destination is that outpost a mile ahead, yes? It is, but we're only permitted one mile. By coercion. There's no law against citizens assisting you the rest of the way of their own volition. Come, my friends. Uh, but if anyone it... says anything, say that we offered. Rabbi, what are we doing? Why would we just help Romans? Do this. Where did we meet? By the sermon on the Chorazin plain. Good. Whenever you are troubled, think back on my message. Maybe, uh... Let us take back the helmets, so there's no confusion at the outpost. If you like. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
Give me that. I'll take it. I've got it. Hey, if anyone forces you to go one mile, go with him too. <laughs> Romans chapter 12, verse 21 puts it like this. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. And when you live out Jesus' commands to go the second mile, to go beyond what anyone expects, I promise you, people are going to notice. And it spreads. Uh, it spreads like a wildfire in your family, in our church, in our community, in our schools, and in our workplaces. So, imagine. Imagine if you and I committed to this radical way of life, serving with joy, going further than expected. And Jesus tells us that this kind of love, well, it can turn enemies into friends. It can turn strangers into neighbors. And it can turn rivals into brothers and sisters. So here's the choice that is before us today. We can live a life focused on our rights, defending ourselves, holding grudges, or we can choose to go the second mile. We can choose to surrender our rights and to serve others in Jesus' name. As we were with our teaching team on Thursday, um, I, I had this as um, the second mile responses, and there were two. But the more we began to talk about it, we said, no, there's not really two responses. There's probably three, maybe four. Uh, so imagine, picture this with me. There are two Jewish men. Both of them may be working out in their gardens, and a Roman soldier approaches and yells to them, commands them to carry their load. This man does so reluctantly, counting every step until he comes to that peg that he had placed years before. And when he gets there, he throws that sack down and he says, I hope, no, I pray that this Messiah overturns the Romans. And if you think I'm just going to ask you to carry my sack one mile, you're crazy. I'm going to do far worse to you. And then he turns around. He begins that one-mile journey back home, kicking the rocks and the dirt and maybe cursing at those that approach him, going back to his family, probably breaking that shovel he had been working with over a rock and yelling at his spouse and children. But there's a different response. Where someone says, yes, sir, gladly. He comes and picks up this knapsack, these pieces of equipment that the soldier would have carried. And as they're walking, he says, hey, tell me a little bit about yourself. You married? You have children? How long have you been serving? What's your life like? Is there anything I can pray with you about? And they approach that mile marker. And the Roman soldier, as you saw in the video depicted by the chosen, would have said, You've gone as far as you have to go. No, I'm, I'm fine. I'll keep walking. But the guy says, what is wrong with you? Like, I've never met anyone like you. I follow the Messiah, Jesus. And this is the life that my king tells me to live. Those are the two responses, right? But no. Because imagine the response of that soldier. One probably doesn't think anything about the person he encountered that day. I mean, because every encounter was like that one. But the other one. Maybe he does go home. Maybe he says to his family, I, I met someone today. Like, I encountered someone today. I, I don't even know how to tell you guys. You know how 
a Jewish person has to carry my equipment, my backpack for one mile? And they're all like, yes, Papa. He didn't do it. What do you mean he didn't do it? No, he went way beyond a mile. And I just can't get it out of my head. He said something about a Messiah. <laughs> something about a teaching on a mountainside. That if you're asked to go one mile, no, you go two. And that you are to love your neighbor the way you love yourself. Imagine that response. What's your response? What's your response to this teaching that we know very little about and yet we are commanded to carry out? Are you a one-miler or are you a second-miler? As Zig Ziglar said, the second mile is never busy, never crowded on the second mile. What if STF said, oh no, not in our church, not in our community, that second mile is going to be crowded. There's going to be a lot of people walking the second mile. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for Jesus. God, thank you for the teachings. And Lord, a lot of times it's easy for us to ascribe love. But this was hard love. This was a difficult love that he was teaching. And so, God, I, I pray as we embrace this teaching this morning, maybe something that's really obscure to us. But yet, God, even though no one's ever asked us to go a mile, God, we know people have asked us to go a mile in other things. And God, I pray that we would be a person, we would be a church that wouldn't just go one. We would go two. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.